Have you ever looked at a newborn baby resting quietly? I mean, just that's, that's just a nice image to think about, isn't it? Yeah, if, if that doesn't bring a smile to your face, there's something wrong with you, right? I mean, just looking at a baby when they're sleeping and resting peacefully, it's, it's a beautiful sight. It, it warms the heart. It's the wonder of, of creation and, and God's handiwork and, and life, and it's amazing. And it's the hope of the future as we look upon that little face. And for one very special couple that we've been talking about through these weeks of Advent, not special in that they were different from other people, they were people just like us, but special because of what they did and how they responded to God's plan for them. But this couple looking on the face of a newborn beheld something even a little more, maybe than what we have before. Take a look at a video this morning as we get started. Don't worry, my boy. You'll be nice and warm. I wrapped you in your mother's old blanket. <laughs> Some star we've had, huh? A 90-mile walk just so you could get born in a stable. <laughs> you know, if we were back home in Nazareth, oh, I could build you a fine crib. But here, no crib. I have to put you to sleep in the hay. You know, I had my own visit from an angel. to write it down so I wouldn't forget what it said. Joseph, son of David, fear not to take Mary for your wife. For what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. And he will save the people their sins. Did you hear that? You will save us from our sins. You will be, you are the Messiah. And, and I've been chosen to be the Messiah's papa. I do not know how it will happen, but I'm, I'm done doubting. I want to tell you how happy that you make me. You know, it's more than happiness. It's, what did the shepherds say the angels told them? They, they bring Good news. Great joy. Yes. That's what it is. It's joy. That's what you bring. Sweet, beautiful boy. You bring me so so much joy. Joy. While we might be inclined to think of joy as being free from difficulties and struggles and having a, a smooth path before us, real joy is something that we can hold on to even in times of difficulty, even through the hard times. And the message that the angels declared in the sky over Bethlehem was indeed good news of great joy for all people. It didn't mean that all the difficulties and the struggles were over yet. But it is something that we can hold on to knowing that the days of hard times will cease. And in the meantime, the joy is in the promise and in 
obedience. In our obedience to the plan that God has. Once more, I want to read you our passage this morning. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, a righteous man, and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. And he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus, just as he had been instructed to do. You know, before sonograms made it possible for expectant fathers to be aware of whether they would be welcoming a, a bouncing baby boy or rather a little girl into the world, it seems that God decided to get in on the gender reveal party in his own unique way, in his own supernatural way. Before the angels had shouted and sung their joyous songs of glory to God in the highest above the shepherds in the fields that night, he had sent an angel by way of a dream to the man who would hold the honor of being Jesus' earthly dad. I can't imagine that. It's a heavy enough thing just to be a dad, but to think you're going to be Jesus' dad. I mean, wow. What a thing to that. But God chose to, to intervene in this situation a little early and begin to speak and, and uh, let him know what was going on. And, and so the message came to this man during a time when he was doing what many dads, it seems, never get quite enough time to do. He was sleeping, right? And so it comes to him in the dream and, and begins to speak to him. And Scripture doesn't record any exploding halos filled with blue powder to celebrate the occasion, as, as we might think of today. But Matthew's gospel captures the moment when Joseph heard the news. It's a boy. It's a boy. And from that moment forward, Joseph knew that he was going to have a son. And he knew it was a special assignment straight from the hand of God. Something unique, something different, something very weighty. And you know, I, I do think Mary and Joseph were special people. Again, not in the sense that they were different from us. They were people just like us, experiencing life much the way that we do. And, uh, but they were special people in the way that they responded to God. You know, Krista and the kids did a, a great job last week presenting God's love for us and kind of Mary's perspective of the story in that as well. But this morning we're going to take a look at Joseph's perspective because Joseph was not chosen by God because of chance, but he as well was a part of this story and this purpose and there are things we can learn from his role in this. You know, he speaks of joy and, and in this video he reflected on the joy and we can probably identify with the joy of a newborn baby. You know, all of us who've been parents and had the opportunity to hold that child in our arms, there is an unspeakable joy in that moment. I mean, you just, you never want it to end and it, everything else just doesn't matter. And he talks about the joy and, and so we want to talk about that this morning, the real joy that begins in faith. You know, joy and happiness are not the same thing. We've talked about this before. Many people might think so, but joy and happiness are not the same thing. And there are those who will mistakenly or maybe even intentionally trade lasting joy for momentary happiness. Because joy may have elements of delayed gratification, though. It requires faith. It's something sometimes we have to hold on and wait for and persist in pursuing. Now, Joseph and Mary as well, were people of faith, no doubt. They had to be. People of pretty deep faith, I think, in what God asked them to do. You know, many of us don't necessarily want to pray and ask what God wants us to do because we're afraid he might send us to Africa, right? You know, the prayers we pray may not be that on that line of, God, where would you really like me to go? What would you really like me to do? Our prayers are more probably like, God, here's what I'd like to do. Could you bless that for me? You know, could you send me this way? 
but they were people of faith. God shows up on their scene and begins to speak to them and say, hey, I've got a plan and you're part of it. And this is the purpose I want you to fulfill in this. At the same time, while they were people of faith and ready to respond to what God was doing, they needed something to face what was ahead. You know, we look at this story very romantically, very beautifully. We, we encapsulate it in the manger scene and all of that, and everything seems blissful. This is not a blissful story. This is a very rough story, a very challenging story, a very difficult-to-face kind of situation. And they needed something to face that, and we find that God provided what they needed through angelic visitations and promise, right? He sends the angel to Mary, broad daylight, to speak to her and say, hey, you need to know this, and, and gives her the message. And even Joseph has his own visit and a dream to speak to him and say, hey, here's what's going on, and here's my promise of what's happening. Joseph is spoken of as a righteous man. He was a man who was devoted to God in his heart, who was living for God, who was striving for that obedience. And God gave him a vision and some direction, and he took it in faith. And faith, as it always does, produced obedience. The demonstration of our faith shows up in the obedience, in the acting on the faith, in the walking it out. And, and we see that as faith produced obedience. And this is where the joy begins. Jesus would later say, 30-some years later, when he's grown and, and engaging in his earthly ministry, in John chapter 15, verse 9 and following, we read, as he was saying, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The joy is in the obedience, in the faith, and in that obedience that walks out that faith. And we too must be a people of faith to make the journey that God has laid out for us. The path that's before our feet, the steps that we are called to walk in. But in faith and obedience, there is joy. In fact, there is no more secure place to be no more contented place to be than to be in the middle of God's will. There are times when it seems like everything is out of control and we're in a panic and we're just kind of scrambling around trying to figure out what to do next. And sometimes it's not even that bad, the craziness going on around us. And yet you can find someone who just knows that God has spoken and they've gotten on this path to be where God wants me to be right now. And even when everything else seems to blow up around them, they can be calm and cool and collected in that moment because there is no better place to be than where God has spoken and what he's directed us to do. And so the joy and the peace and the contentment can be there even in the middle of all the other things going on around us. Some of the difference between the happiness and the joy. The joy comes from the inside. The happiness we try to make happen from the outside. But it begins in the faith. And the faith plays out in the obedience. Something else we see in Joseph in this story is that the real joy is anchored in hope. So I said before, the promise of joy was not a promise that the difficulties have all ended. Hey, it's time to be joyful because all your troubles are over. Bliss from here on out. No worries, no concerns. That was not the promise. In fact, we know there are still many struggles before us. But when the troubles do come, it's hope that keeps us steady. And that hope is built on trust in the one that we have the relationship with. Now again, I think Joseph and Mary as well were very courageous people. Very courageous people to face what they faced, to walk through what God had asked them to walk through, to go through the circumstances this put them in, they were very courageous people. I don't know if you've thought about it before, but think of the response that they faced from family and friends. These two young people who have been people trying to pursue God in their life, for Mary, all of a sudden, here she is on the eve of getting married and everything going the way it's supposed to go for a young Jewish girl, and now all of a sudden she's pregnant. And she's got to try to explain to her family and friends, oh no, it's okay, this is from God. You know, you can imagine the situation this puts her in, right? All of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, I thought so much better of her, you know? Never would have expected that from her. It's such a shame. You know, what, what a waste. What a lost opportunity. What she was going to face in the challenge of that. 
And I mean, it was actually even more than that. Not just the reputation, not just the thoughts. She was literally in danger of being stoned to death, right? Well, it's obvious that you've engaged in fornication according to the law. You should be put to death. You should be stoned to death. They could take her out to the edge of the city and throw the rocks. Joseph was in that as well because that's where Joseph gets in that spot. As much as he loves her, if he attaches himself to her, he's just as guilty. Facing the same possibility, the same opportunity. These were courageous people. This was not just the blissful scene that we might imagine. There was some real wrestling to go on here. There was some challenge in what was before them. And so they're facing great challenges in that. God's favor, we find in this, may not be seen as such by others. You know, Mary responded when the angel came to her. Oh, she, she saw the blessing and, and praised the Lord. And may it be to your servant as you've said. And, and even Joseph seems to respond with that kind of fervor. God, if this is what you want, it's a blessing. But you know what? People around us may not always see the blessing in what God has laid out. In fact, they may look at us and say, dude, you're nuts. This is foolishness. This is crazy. Why would you do that? Why, why would you go that direction? Are you a religious fanatic? What, what is the deal? They may see it as shame in what you go through, the, the hardship, because the picture isn't clear for others yet. So God's favor may be a little bit of a challenge. You know, when we read about Mary's story, it says that she went away for a while. Maybe this was why. When she went to visit Elizabeth, you know, she just needed to get out of town, get away from there. It may have been a blessing with that census that took them down to Bethlehem. And we're not entirely certain how long they stayed in Judea. They stayed at least until the time of her cleansing when they went to the temple about a month later. We don't know how long it was before the Magi came to the house, but maybe that was part of why they stayed in Judea too. It was easier to be away from what they had come out of and the way they were looked at rather than going back home with that new baby at that time. Difficult things to face. And yet in the middle of that, I think their joy was very full. I love this video this morning and that portrayal. You know, we don't see much of Joseph. We don't hear quite as much about him in the narrative in Scripture. And we don't see him portrayed as much maybe in the stories. But I like to think that's probably how it was. That he was full of joy and happiness and excitement at what God was doing around them and, and for them and for their people and that they got to be a part of it. Because joy is sustainable, even unshakable, where there is hope. Where there is hope. You know, as Paul wrote to the believers in Rome some time later, some believers who also faced some very great challenges, in Romans 15 and verse 13, it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The connection is there between the hope and the joy in what God is doing. God's plan requires hope and courage for us as well. Following after Jesus is not for sissies. Okay, people want to play it out that way sometimes. Well, that Jesus stuff, that's just a crutch and you must be weak and you need all of that. No, it's tough following Jesus. Jesus was tough and following that road is tough. It's not for the weak. And so they were courageous as they followed after him. But it, it was spawned out of the hope they had in what God had promised and their trust was in that promise that it would not be broken because they knew that the one they were trusting was trustworthy. Trustworthy. And so it might seem like foolishness to others, but they were hanging on to it. And they were going to be obedient to the very last step of whatever they were asked to do. You can go on in Matthew and we find two other occasions. God comes and speaks to Joseph by an angelic vision that he has and gives him instruction and at each point Joseph is obedient I mean in the moment you know when he comes and says get up and take the child and go they don't even wait till morning time he's up and gone you know when God speaks he moves he's obedient and follows because he knows the one he is following is trustworthy and in the process of all of this we find that real joy is found in him you know, part of the elusiveness of joy is the way that we pursue it. Joy will not be found by pursuing it, but only when we're pursuing Him. 
It's another one of those big differences between joy and happiness. People, we're surrounded by people today that are trying to find happiness. That's their whole pursuit. I want to find happiness. You know, I want to have a good job. I want to have a spouse. I want to have the kids. I want to have the opportunities. I want to do this, 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 and this because I want to be happy. And they're pursuing happiness. And as parents, we kind of push our kids that way too. You know, we want them to have every opportunity. We want them to be in the right place, get to do the right things, have the right friends, the right school, all this stuff, so that they'll be happy, right? But we're pursuing the, the thing. We're pursuing the happiness. And it, it just seems to get messed up and bumped up along because it doesn't work that way. Joy and happiness are not the same. And happiness we try to define in our circumstances around us and, and everything being right. And so we try to manipulate and control it, and we can't. But happiness is like the dog chasing its tail. You know, it's the whole thing. What I thought would make me happy, and so I chased and chased and chased, and I get a hold of it. It doesn't make me happy. What made me happy yesterday doesn't make me happy today. It's gone. It evaporated. It changed. But joy, like we're talking about on the inside, in the hope and the promise and the trustworthiness of the one who's spoken can't be taken away. And it doesn't matter what the circumstances around us are. That's joy. And that's valuable. And that's lasting. And Joseph was devoted to the Lord. He and Mary both. They were devoted to what God had called them to do. They were devoted to him. You know, in the middle of this story, I have to believe is consistent with Scripture and what I see all the way across, they still had a choice. They could have said, nope, I don't think so. I'm not doing it this way. I'm going another route. I'm going another path. I don't like this. I'm not sure I'm down for this. What I believe makes them special is their response. They were ready and willing to believe what God had said. They were willing to embrace with obedience what God asked. And Joseph demonstrated faith, obedience, and dependence on God. I don't think you could have a greater example of a godly man. Society tells us a man is independent and takes care of himself and he's, he's tough and he forces his way through. But here we see a man who indeed was tough, but in a very different way. He demonstrated faith and obedience to God and a dependence on God to get him through what he'd called on him to do. That's manliness. And he was great at it. And I think God chose him for a reason. Again, I couldn't imagine the overwhelming task of saying, you're going to be the father to the son of God. And yet Joseph embraced it. And he took care of him. And he protected him. And he raised him. And he trained him. And invested in him. And it all went the way that God had planned for it to. But the joy is found when we're not really looking for it. Because the joy is in him. Romans 14, 17 puts it this way. It says, for the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. When we come into the kingdom, when we walk in that relationship with him, it's part of what it means to be his. It is righteousness, his righteousness given to us. Peace because the separation from him is gone. The anxiety is gone. And it's joy in the Holy Spirit. That satisfying, lingering joy. There is a course marked out for us. That path before our feet. And we still have a choice as well. Whether we'll walk that path in obedience. Whether we'll have faith to believe in what God has said. Be obedient to it and depend on Him to see us through and to accomplish what He's asked. But it takes more than a halfway, think so, try it out kind of thing. You know, when we get to the end of the book in Revelations 2 and 3, as, as Jesus is speaking to the churches, as John writes, he makes seven promises to the one who overcomes. The things that God has promised to the one who overcomes. What we're hoping for. And while we don't ever go in our own strength, it's not about, well, you need to be up to this and you just got to set your mind to it and you got to do it. We don't do it in our own strength, but we do have to make up our own mind. To act on that faith and be devoted to the one who's worthy of that trust and devotion. And his joy follows. His joy follows. 
And that's why we read those strange things in Scripture. Like when someone like James, the Lord's brother, when Mary and Joseph did get the opportunity to have their own children together after that, why someone like James can say, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Knowing that the testing of your faith works patience. And patience will have its perfect work in transforming us. So that joy is there, even in the difficulty. And I think Mary and Joseph, they went through some tough stuff. You know, the trip they made, the things they had to face with people around them. You know, they get to Bethlehem and there's no room. And it's like, really, God? Couldn't you even have gotten a reservation in advance, you know? And yet it was all God's plan. I think they had joy in the middle of those things. I think they knew God was with them. I think they were savoring the moments. We read how Mary was treasuring up these things in her heart, and I think Joseph was too, in the moments that God had given them. You know, the message of the angels was good news of great joy. It was about a Savior. His joy comes to us. And with faith and hope, we find our joy in Him. And the joy of a father, both on earth and in heaven, remains more than we can possibly imagine at Christmas. But we can rest assured the hopes and fears of all the years that we heard about in the song are still met in Jesus because he still saves. He's still the hope and the answer. He's still life for us. It's the transforming power of what he's done. And it's still his joy to do so today. In fact, we're going to get to celebrate today in baptism. And I can't think of a greater gift to give back to Jesus on his birthday than to see somebody's life given over to him in baptism. Someone stepping across the line to say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. My life belongs to you. So may the joy of Advent be yours this Christmas season, the real and lasting joy. Even in Christmas, we can be distracted by the happiness, right? Got to find the right gift. Got to have the decorations just right. What about the meal? You know, we got to arrange the event. No. The joy is not in the external things. The joy is in what he's done as he comes to reside in us. And we find that joy this Advent season. Would you stand with me? I want to pray with you this morning. Okay, so we're going to celebrate in just a few moments in, in baptism. And uh, we've got a couple more songs to sing. We're going to go to our response time. And ask that the Holy Spirit would speak to us this morning. Each one of us where we're at. If you're here this morning and you have a need and you want prayer today, this is the time to step out during this next song. Come to the front. We'll meet you at either side of the front. The scripture says we'll anoint you with oil. We'll pray over you. Pray with you. Let's just look to him right now. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be in your house today. And we thank you for this wonderful Advent season. Lord, as we celebrate your coming Coming and being Emmanuel, God with us, to show us the way, to be the sacrifice for our sins, to open up the door for us. Lord, Advent is just a reminder to us that we look to your promise to come back again as King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, that the peace that you promised, the full and lasting eternal peace, is coming as well, Lord, when all things are finished. We're in that time of waiting and the now and the not yet, and we have that joy and peace on the inside, but we still go through the struggles on the outside. Sometimes we get frustrated and we feel like quitting. It's like, God, are you ever going to fix it? And we know your word promises that you are. As you come back as King of kings and Lord of lords to restore all things. And Lord, may we be reminded it's only because of your patience for those who've not heard or accepted the message yet. And so Lord, especially in this time of the year when we have the opportunity, may we be ambassadors to declare that message of hope and joy and peace that we have in you. Lord, I don't know what everybody's time leading up to Christmas has been like. It's been a little bit of a, a short season this year, the way the dates have fallen, and some people feel, feel pushed and pressured and trying to get things done. Lord, may we be reminded to slow down and celebrate what's been given to us. May we enjoy our families and our friends and bless them. And uh, may we be refreshed in you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen.